Hey, Will, remember Kodak packs? No. Oh. Hey, 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 Will, you know what I hate? Uh, lemon scented pledge and Kodak packs. Oh, you know, you know what I don't miss installing at all? Look, you should never have installed Kodak packs. They were always bad. I mean, they always felt a little dodgy. I never quite knew where they came from or like what Xvid was exactly, but I knew that I had footage of GameCube games that I had I absolutely needed to see. And what other option was there until today's project? Well, hold on. Xvid was the open source version of the DivX codec, which was actually one of the good ones. It was all the ones that were like the dodgy ones where you'd get like, hey, by the way, we're going to install 15 different codecs and we're also going to install this. And this will play any video you ever want, except when you tried to use the wrong application, it wouldn't know what to do with that video. And then it would need another codec pack. And we made a lot of magazines about how to unmess up your computer from installing multiple codec packs at Maximum PC. It was a real problem. Yeah. And then... Yeah, it just went away. I did actually did not know that about Xvid. Like that's I didn't realize Xvid was one of the good ones. Uh, like somebody should do a history of this stuff sometime. But the point is, then along came VLC, which we're going to talk to the founder and maintainer of today. I can't wait. And kind of just swept all of that away. It was glorious. Like sands through a codec pack. Yes, like codecs off the moons of Jupiter. <laughs> Welcome to the FOSPOD. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Today's episode of the FOSPOD is brought to you by Google Open Source. They bring all the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source. You can find out more at opensource.google. This week on the FOSPOD, we have Jean-Baptiste Kempf, who is the lead developer of an open source project that you almost certainly, I'm going to bet like 90% of listeners already have on their computer, VLC. Oh yeah, I would be shocked if every person listening to this hasn't at least voluntarily used VLC once or twice. I mean, you know, like there's other stuff like Curl that we've done, like we've said, is kind of under the hood of everything, but in terms of things that people actively go seek out and download, like... It is impossible for me to imagine setting up a new MacBook or a new Windows desktop or anything and not immediately just shortlisting VLC as one of the installers I need to go get. For me, like my road with VLC started with somebody who was like a, a person who did a lot of video editing. We had a, a file that was being recorded from a camera. The camera ran out of battery. The file didn't close. And I was like, hey, what do we do with this file? And our video editor was like, look, go download this VLC thing. And this was 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe at this point, go download this VLC thing. If it can't open it, the video is gone. You're gonna have to shoot it again. And like for a long, long time, VLC has been the gold standard for me of if this video is still a video, if it, if it still maintains its integral video-ness, VLC will open it. Otherwise, everything else is kind of second place for that. That's one of the things that was so great about talking to Jean-Baptiste in this, because yeah, like I, I went in knowing like, yes, VLC not only plays every format under the sun, but it's strangely good at playing files that seem like they should be unplayable or broken in some way. He gave historical and technical context to why that is. I never thought about, I, you know, in my mind, it was just like, oh, VLC is good. That was the end of the explanation. But like he actually explains in terms of VLC's origins, why it's so good at, at doing stuff like that. It's, it was a really fascinating Pretty wide ranging conversation. But the other thing that's interesting about this talking about VLC is that it mirrors the history of video on the internet. You know, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but like I downloaded uh, the first South Park short, The Spirit of Christmas, when I was, you know, living on an ISDN line and, and I had a fast internet connection at the time. It still took like 15 hours to download. And then I had to download another program to run that because there was no video player built into Windows. There was no website that made it easy to watch video on the internet at this point. You had to download files and then you hoped you had the right codec on the machine. And then in the early 2000s, broadband started becoming more accessible, at least in the US, and people were downloading more and more videos. But we still didn't have good tools to play those videos. People didn't know about VLC at the time. You would download all these codec packs, which would install the codecs at a system level on Windows. And then they conflict with each other. Like you'd have three different codecs installed on Windows for the same file format. And, and you could end up really messing up your computer and, and A, infecting yourself with a bunch of viruses and malware, but B, making it so that 
like commonly used video codecs like MPEG-2 just wouldn't work on your computer really, really easily. And then VLC came in and kind of solved that problem for downloaded videos, which was a, a real service. It's just a, it's a fascinating, I mean, of course I would say that I was there. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was a fascinating conversation. I mean, it starts in the sixties with some history about the origins of the project in France. Unsurprisingly, a guy like John Baptiste that's worked, he's worked on a piece of software for decades now that interacts with, you know, the movie industry and patent law and all kinds of adjacent fields. And he's got tons of experience with legal ins and outs, insight into where current and future video codecs are going, just like a, a, a very broad base of experience that made it really fun to pick his brain. So the story of VLC is a bit a complex one because like what people expect is people wanted to create VLC, but the fact is no one actually planned to do VLC. The story starts in basically in the late 60s because it was one of the top engineering school in France and they were inside Paris. It was too small. So they had to go outside of Paris to be bigger. And the, the state wanted them to be in the middle of nowhere. And the alumni didn't like that. So they decided to go just like in the suburbs of Paris and they bought a big piece of land. And then they said, well, now you can build your university over there. For the US, it's, it doesn't feel weird, but for France, it's extremely weird because that was a, a university a school paid by the French state that was on private land. Of course, the private land was a non-profit of the alumni, blah, 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 but that's still very weird. The result of that is that everything done on the campus was managed by students, whether TV, radio, every party, food, marketplace, everything was done by the students for the students. And in the 1980s, network. So one of the alumni wanted to try to deploy a large token ring network uh, and decided that, well, students is a good thing, right? Because if it breaks, it breaks, right? It's the 80s. That's okay. So they deployed a token ring network, which was very large, which was, it had 1,500 people on it. And they started working on it. And actually, well, very fine, right? Because... Well, to go to NNTP and news groups and also send email and find by telenetting on a server, that was enough. But 90s arrive and there is a beginning of FPS and the web. And the latency, you start when you play video games on network, you care about the latency, right? And so they, they, the students who are managing the network, this nonprofit that manages the network, want a new network, a faster one. And so they go to the university and say, well, you know, to work, we need a better network. And of course, the university says, oh, we would love to help you. But you understand, we don't own this campus, right? So go away. <laughs> and then, hey, you know what? Like, go and see these and these companies because maybe they care. So they go and they go to see a TV station called TF1, which is one of the major broadcasts in France. And the guy says, well, the future of video is the satellite. So, well, it's not. But in 1994, 1995, well, that was a good guess, right? And so the problem with satellites was that you needed those huge decoder MPEG-2 boxes, which costed several hundreds of dollars, and then a satellite dish, right? And that was insane because like, for 1,500 students, you needed one decoder and one dish. And, and the cost would be in terms of millions, right? And of course, the students would destroy it every year, right? Like, you know, students on a campus and then you buy new ones and so on. So the idea was just like, hey, you know what? Like, we're going to put one big dish and one big decoder, and then we stream that on the network. And because, of course, we're going to destroy your 10 megabit token ring network, we'll buy you a new one, right? So that's a good demo, right? So 3Com is on board, IBM is on board, and everyone loves the idea. And they, they start to do a proof of concept of streaming video on a network. You have to remember that at that time, right, the faster computer was the Pentium 90, right? Because in 95, arise the Pentium 100 and 133. And doing decoding of MPEG-2 real-time on a computer was like insane, right? Absolutely impossible. But the students said, well, you know what? We're going to try it. So it takes them around one year to build the network, get the money, get everything, and then to build the software. So end of 19... 96, 1997, they have a demo and the demo works. So of course, the computer has 64 megabytes of RAM, which is a lot at the time. Uh, of course, the demo crashes after 45 seconds. So they, they stop the demo at 42. And of course, the, the software is a mess. 
And of course, it's based on Linux. So that's the project, which was called Network 2000. And this project could have been stopped there, right? So they had like a very strong ATM core data center grade network on this campus. And they were happy, right? And, and the story could have stopped there. But around almost one year after, because those are student projects, so every graduate student has a project. And, and so a new generation of students arrive and they say, you know what? This streaming of video on a local network, video LAN, could be interesting for other people. So we are going to try to do it and we're going to try to open source it. And that's end of 1998. And it takes them around two years to rebuild the solution, but mostly to get it open source because the university doesn't have that much money compared to other university. And so they wanted to basically get money out of that, right? Because there was this, I think the MIT team got money with their MPEG-1 video decoder and MPEG-1 audio decoder. So they wanted to do the same around MPEG-2. And so that's how they want to basically get some money out of it. So going open source is absolutely not like the idea. But they realized that the software is so complex that if the users, the students are not on board, they're never going to make it open source. So after two years, they cave in. And in February 2001, the software gets GPL. So it's important to, to talk about this MPEG-2 decoding thing because like, I, I was in college then. I remember having a, like, even a Pentium 200 a couple of years later. You still needed a dedicated MPEG-2 decoder card to play even like DVD bitrate video smoothly, right? You, it, it was kind of up and down on most players. And the idea that you could do video on a computer back then was like B pitched their whole OS pitch on, hey, you can run all these video windows on this desktop PC in 1996. It's hard to remember how weird it was to see a video on a computer at that time, right? Like it was exciting. You had those Intel video codec, right? In IV30, IV40, which was like basically 100 pixel wide and like really like... Um, Stamps, right? Stamp size, right? And that was very difficult. You're correct for having MPEG 2 audio plus video decoding, you need a Pentium 2, 266 megahertz. And that was basically what you needed. But so at the beginning, what they did was streaming like lower resolution. So they were transcoding and then sending that almost uh, very low encoding on the network because then you didn't care about the bandwidth, right? Because it was locally. So there was a big machine taking the MPEG-2 and downsizing it very badly and trimming that as MPEG-1. But by 1998, well, you could almost, like everyone's, every student had something related to Pentium 2 or Pentium 3 that was able to do decoding, so that was okay. So for folks who don't know, France has a long history with computer networks, and I wonder if the success of the Minitel which for people who don't know, it was a dial-in service that was created by the phone company to provide phone books, white page listings, phone number lookups, yellow page listings, news, train ticket purchases, and, and other services that you could subscribe to starting a really, really long time ago. It started in the, it was developed in the late 70s and started in the 80s. And people used it up, up and through the rise of the internet. I think they said when they shut it off in 2012, there were still several million subscribers. So it was a wildly successful device that was a core part of like French culture. And I wondered if that made it easier when the students were pitching this video network for the school, if that made it easier to get buy-in. So there is a very strong mathematical community in France, a very strong mass, and uh, network and codec is one of the big questions, right? So they, on network, there was this everything related to uh, France Telecom at the time and Alcatel on MP3 or, or France Telecom was one of the, had a lo lot of money, uh, of patents and so on. So there is, there was a culture on that. Minitel, of course, is so weird, but like, seriously, it was so simple and so much working, right? Like you needed the number of someone you could like, 36, 11, and you have it. There, there is so many things that were easier on Minitel than today where you have like to, even like buying, a, um, I remember buying train tickets on Minitel when in the early 90s. And it was like, you wanted to put the name of where you wanted to go, where you wanted to go, two cities, 
states and so on. Today, you have to go, you have like 25 pop-ups about uh, GDPR, and then you have another pop-up about like, hey, click on my news data. You have lots of ads and horrible things tracking you. And in the end, when you buy it, it's it's even more expensive. But it's still, they, then they say, hey, you know, you can buy this subscription for whatever bullshit they give you, right? So I, I know the military is really weird, but for so many things, it was easier than even to the internet. I feel like the hallmark of VLC is the fact that you have built your own stack to support everything, codecs, formats, networking. I mean, libvlc is the thing that drives VLC. You know, it's not like FFmpeg is under the hood doing all your decoding or something like that. Was that a philosophical choice early on to build everything yourself, or was that driven more by necessity just because there were not other options to plug in at the time? Because it wasn't like, like there wasn't any option at the time, right? There was nothing, right? So 1998, 1999, like to have an MPEG-2 decoder and MPEG-2 encoder and an MPEG video and audio decoder, you didn't have anything, right? And then to do MPEG-TS, which was what DVB, so satellite uh, TV was, you didn't have much choice, right? It was the, the TS, MPEG TS support in, in FMPEG has always been quite weak, to be honest. And VLC is a real-time video player, and, and people don't understand that because the main use case was to play video on a network. And so the VideoLAN client part, which was VideoLAN client, was not the major part of the of the VideoLAN project, right? Because there was a lot of work on, on the server, and there was a lot of work on on the network, especially because they managed to do multicast on the network that was not able to do multicast. And so there were some active things on, on the network doing crazy stuff on, on the routers in order to do that. The client, because it had MPEG-2, then people around it started to put DVDs playback, right? And the DVD CSS arrived after the CSS. And so a lot of the format support was done by VLC. You also have to realize that VLC is a very modular approach, right? So they have modules for everything. And for a long time, maybe it's not true anymore, but the, the, the DMUXs, so the format support on VLC was much better than the one in FFmpeg. And also that alternative decoders were faster. So it doesn't matter that much today, but it mattered a lot in the past. But as a result of why VLC became popular, which is a bit your underlying question, it's a lot of factors that were not really like design, right? So one of the things that VLC did well was to play broken files. The reasons VLC plays broken files very well is because it's based on a network, right? It's a player for network and you play a video on a network, which is UDP. You expect packets to be dropped. So there is a lot of resilience on every format support in, in VLC, right? So we, which made it very good when you were downloading things over uh, DC++, Donkey, EMU, or whatever you used to do, CASA. Of course, none of you ever done that because there was copyright infringement, and that's very bad. But when you were doing that, and you were on your 56K modem, and it took one freaking day to download all that, and of course, you wanted well, your mom not to hang, take the phone because that <laughs> would cut it in the middle, and it would take 24 hours. And in the end, you realize that you were downloading a Disney movie and then you got a, a football recording or you were downloading a football recording and, and you got born, right? Absolutely horrible. Because VLC was able to basically play the file directly. Of course, you couldn't watch it, but like in five, after one hour of download, you could just see whether it was okay or not. And that was quite useful. And also like there are a lot of errors on DVDs, right? So, you where people were sharing DivX and so on, but like so many files were half corrupted and, and VLC just doesn't care, tries to go down. So that's one of the major reasons. Reason. Second reason is that VLC was done, VideoLand client at that time was done for Linux, right? And so some people arrived, which were outside of the, the Central Paris University and ported it on Windows and on, on, on Mac OS. And at that time, all the video players on macOS or Windows were based on the codecs from the system, right? So you horrible direct show thing or QuickTime, and you had to download codec packs, which were half malware, half horrible things. But that would have been so much different from VLC on Linux, right? So when they ported VLC from Linux to Windows or macOS, the simplest was to bundle the codecs, right? 
well, the, the package that you do on Unix, right? You have libav codec or libdivx and so on. And so that was the simplest. The thing is, like, VLC on Windows and Mac was extremely independent from the system, which was something that was extremely rare, which is why, like, VLC was the only way to play DVDs on macOS for almost two or three years, macOS 10. And on Windows, like, people say, hey, it works without codec packs. And people started installing codec packs, but, like, we don't care about codec packs, right? So you can install 20 different and VLC doesn't care. So the thing is, it's not that people design it to be that way, right? No one like arrive and say, well, I'm going to do a, a software, a player that is going to play everything under the sun, well, not for every platform and be resilient to, to failures. It was just like, there was a student project started like that by guys on Linux and BOS, um, moved to there and ported it because it was open source and added more and more formats because it was modular, so it was easy to add formats. And so the software grew, but there wasn't like a big design at the beginning. It feels like it was just the right framework and then the right place in the right time, but then also the people working on it continued to push it. It seemed like by supporting everything, you ended up supporting the right things. Like you ended up supporting H.264 early in a way, and then H.264 ended up being the prevalent codec for a whole multitude of reasons. But it, I mean, you also supported a bunch of other things that didn't end up going anywhere that ended up not being as popular as, as H.264, right? Yeah, but like, so the VLC user base is what? 500 million people? So even a very weird codec has many users, right? So it's just like the, the thing about like, no one is using these more than 10% of Word. That is true, but not everyone uses the same 10%. So a lot of weird codecs also is what make VLC popular. Well, there's something incredibly powerful about having a tool in your toolbox that you can go grab a file that you recorded on a point and shoot camera 15 years ago and be like, oh, well, I know I, VLC will handle this. It knows how to deal, deal with this. Yeah. I feel like there's probably a pretty thorny uh, kind of legal aspect to a lot of what you've been describing. You know, you've talked about, you know, D DVD encryption and DCSS, and, you know, there are a lot of proprietary codecs with licensing fees and so forth that you support. Like, what's what's it been like managing the legal aspect of this project with all of these other kind of corporate players? Have you had to deal with kind of legal challenges and other issues around the stuff that you support? Oh, yeah, yes, a lot. But the thing is, there is um, we have good defense and... I have now a very good understanding about IP laws. And the thing is, you have to understand that a lot of laws around IP is just 100% bullshit. And it's just about like, you're scared about the lawyers, so you back down. And if you look at the number of IP threats compared to the number of lawsuits, it's extremely small. And the thing is, it's mostly due to the American legal system that just like is, to be honest, insane for anyone outside of the U.S. It's insane for people in the U.S. too, JB. <laughs> so the thing is, um, we talking here about software patterns, for example, right? And the thing is, like, I can give you a good example is that lately there was a big company that used to do a codec uh, that was bought several times. And they started by hacking a, a, another codec, right? And and this got popular and they got money by licensing their logo mostly to every DVD player in the market. And lately they moved to basically patent trolling uh, because that makes sense. And they basically told me that they had patented software subtitles lately, right? And it was just like, no, you didn't. They said, yeah, yeah, we did. Like, look at my... And instead of like being afraid or like in the US, you're, you're an engineer, you're forbidden to talk about patents. And so I say, okay, give me the number, right? And then I look at the number. I, I know how to read patents. And I just look at the dates. And I was just like, are you on your email, man? And I give him the commit on VLC that predates his... his, his that implements exactly what he said and predates his, um, his uh, patent. So I'm just like... You, you had prior art. Yeah, I'm just like... So, okay, so this is what happens, right? So now either you don't talk to me ever again or I go public and I explain publicly that your patent is shit. And not only you will not get any money from me, but you're never going to get any money from anywhere in the world. Never heard about. And there is so many of those. It's 
impossible. Multimedia media is so much complex and you can write things in so many weird ways that if you're not an engineer implementing it, you don't realize it. So that's one of the things. The second thing is in France, supposedly software patents are illegal. Right? So everything that is a pure, the pure core of the codec, you cannot patent it because basically those are linear transform, right? Not exactly that, but most of those transforms are basically big matrices, right? It's nothing complex, right? As soon as you understand what is an FFT, as long as you have good enough linear algebra, you can say, well, that doesn't work. And the problem is that there are many companies, including most the American ones like Dolby, who are basically just bullshitting, right? So they have lots of patents and you don't understand which one are the actual essential one that you need to decode the software and which the, the format and which ones are actually techniques to make the decoder faster or implement the encoder to do things, right? Or sometimes even just a patentable technique that sits on top of everything else, right? Exactly, right? But when you're the one who's actually implementing, right, the codec or the software, you're just like, no, we don't do like that. And they were just like, oh, no, but it's not possible. And you say, yes, it's possible. This is how we do. And you realize that they have absolutely no idea about what they are talking about, right? Because they are IP lawyers and they used to scare you and to say, well, basically, we're going to sue you uh, at 5 million. And this is where I come with Videoland, which has no money, right? Videoland has no money. I'm just like, sure, sue me. <laughs> What are you going to get? <laughs> I mean, the nonprofit has maybe $25,000 in bank account, which is going to be gone by the time we start just talking with your lawyers. <laughs> so sue me if you have like a claim, right? Oh, but I'm going to stop you from doing that. I'm just like, sure, but you're going to have to prove that. Because like a lot of this is scaring people, but no one wants to actually know whether they, they have a, a case, right? And, and what happens... In most of the IP discussion, when you go, they arrive with just like, I have 500 patents and you know what? I have 400 of those. And then they count them basically and they, they do cross-licensing. They, they never go into analyze those. It's so difficult. And also in a lot of cases, like the, the copyright holders never wanted the copyright provisions of like the DMCA in the US challenge in court because they it was much more useful to them as a tool had they not lost. If, if they go to court and they lose, the tool's gone. If they don't go to court and just keep threatening people indefinitely, it becomes a valid tool that they can use to apply leverage to anybody who challenges copyright. And I, I, I have to wonder, as the tool that plays everything, including the encrypted stuff, did you all ever have copyright? Did like the entertainment lawyers and the copyright lawyers come after you as well? Or was it mostly the IP folks? Then arrives the second thing, which is not patents, but which is DRM decryption, right? So the problem is that DRM is is a piece of um, of lies again, right? Because DRM is sold to politicians to block piracy, but we've seen that piracy has never been stopped, right? So that means DRM is not a good tool to block the piracy. So why do they continue? That makes wonder, right? Like we started anti-piracy tools with Macrovision in the early nineties, right? We are thirty years later, we still do that. But everything is popular already on screen. So the answer is that DRM is not a tool to protect piracy. And you know that it's called digital rights management. It's not called anti-piracy tools. Because DRM only goal is to control the distribution channels. It's to be sure that everyone from HBO to Netflix to TF1 to Canal Plus is going to pay the patent no, not the patent, the, la patente in French, which is exactly what patent come from, the price so that you pay the right price and you say, yes, so right. And so then Dolby gets his money because they have they force into the uh, standardization body their tool, which is more or less okay or more or less not okay. And everyone did that, right? So they want to control it to be sure that you're going to pay everyone in the industry until the industry stays around. And no one is going to dare do something outside. So DRM is a way to control distribution, to put everyone online and so that they stay there. It's not done to do anything else. And if you understand that, you realize that, yeah, that works, right? Because like no one would go and and do a business around something that are around that. So that's DRM. But if you look at what DRMs are, and especially the major one, which is a DVD, the DVD DRM 
is not a DRAM because it's so easy to break that it's a joke, right? It's like, if you look really like it's a 56, of course, bits of entropy because of stupid American laws at the time in the 90s. But the thing is, there are so many mistakes in the implementation is that, well, basically there is 32 bits of entropy. And well, if you have a trick, you can go to 30 bits of entropy, which is so easy to break that it's not funny. And when you realize what libdvd CSS is doing, which is not what DECSS is doing, is that basically it's brute forcing it. Especially because what happens is that video frames, or at least signaling, is literally always the same. So are we breaking a DRM? Ah, that's a good question. I would say no. But that's also why in VLC, you don't have the Blu-ray de decryption because Blu-ray decryption is an actual DRM. I'm not going to say military grade, but seriously, not far. Hard math. I actually wanted to come in and ask about Blu-ray support because like you said, you've had robust DVD support for years. Uh, I, I had to assume that the, on a technical level, decrypting Blu-ray was just a lot thornier. Is that a situation you ever see improving or are discs just kind of too obsolete a format to even really worry about at this point? So technically, you can play Blu-rays with VLC. You just need to use a third-party software that is basically doing the decryption for you. The thing is, there are actually four DRM systems on the Blu-ray, two of them which are the major one are AACS and BD+. And we have implementation with, in VideoLine as LibACS and LibBD+, which are actually doing the thing. And the thing is, for AACS, which is the major one, they are rotating the keys on every new Blu-ray. And they have a very good system of revoking the keys and track tracing, tracing basically, uh, because playing the Blu-rays in different layers is going to give you not exactly the same video. So then they can track on network after re-encoding which one is the one that leaks. So then they can basically blacklist the public key of this drive. So every time you're going to buy a new Blu-ray, which is going to be a new version, there is one version every two months, it's going to have a, a new blacklist that is quite long and all the players are going to update their blacklist and therefore your software is going to be blacklisted by your hardware disk. It's literally insane. So technically we have everything we want, but unless the root key is published, it's a cow and mouse problem. And it's ridiculous. Because they killed, they actually killed their format by doing that. How so? Have you ever tried to play a Blu-ray? Yes. On the desktop? How difficult was it? It's very difficult. I used a piece of software to break the decryption and then just copied, you know, used Handbrake to copy the files. So, yeah. But that's not playing a Blu-ray. That's converting to a different format. So the thing is, DRMs are actually, because they were sold as piracy, and, and even some authors write that it was on, on piracy. But de facto, who made money on Blu-rays or DVDs is the licensing of E264 and TVC and Sony and so on, right? The, the thing that basically is crack pushed YouTube and Netflix to do their own format is to say, well, no, no, we, you cannot use and take a cut of the money just because you have a new format. But the thing is, Blu-ray got so difficult that, well, no one wants to have that, right? The, the most ridiculous thing was for the Blu-ray 4K or the Ultra HD, which required a specific version of Intel CPUs, which had SGX just to be able to play it legally because whatever, right? And you know what? Like the newer version of Intel CPUs don't have SGX anymore. So you cannot even play legally the, the Blu-rays you bought. And so the people who are pirates, well, they have no problem because like it's everywhere on the Pirate Bay. So Again, the DRM system is hurting people who are lawful. That's always the part that offended me the most, is that I'm a customer, I'm buying discs, I'm, I'm giving you money and you treat me like I'm the person who's stealing, whereas the, the people who are stealing have the unencumbered, unproblematic, works everywhere, no problem files. All the strong around the world studies about piracy said that the people who are pirating more were also the people who are buying more. But the thing is, if you want to keep saying that you're an anti-piracy tool and not a distribution control tool, then you need to say that you're going to fight every pirate problem, right? And because you're going to sell that to the authors who, to be honest, don't care, don't understand a producer, a music artist, they don't get that, right? So they're just like, yeah, we need to fight everything piracy. 
So as soon as you say that, then you need to fight piracy at all costs because that's how you solve your thing. But what happens is that basically you're controlling on the technical level and on the distribution level the control, right? That's also why we still have like five majors for disc and, and three for audio, right? And that people today with Spotify, because Spotify is like 90% of the market, of the streaming market, because it's about control. But the thing is, they made that annoying because what they want is not to block piracy, but that the lie they sold, so they need to stick to it. Spotify is an interesting test case here because, you know, the perfect control, no piracy off Spotify, whatever. Everybody pays their $10 a month and gets all the music they want. But also the artists are getting basically nothing and it's all the people in between that, that get paid on Spotify. So Yeah, they moved at the beginning was like like paradise for artists. And then, well, you know what, like the ones arrived and it's the same people doing the cut. This is moving a little more into codecs than media formats, but you hear a lot about supposedly more open and licensing fee free codecs like AV1 and VP9 these days. Or do you, do you feel optimistic about the future of where codecs like that are going? Or do you think that like the, the MPEG descendant codecs like H265 and 66 are going to continue to dominate? Like how, how do you feel about the future of kind of openness in media codecs? So people don't like me when I say that, but VP9 is a failure because no one deployed it. Basically, only a few gigs on Linux and, and YouTube deployed it, right? So it's a failed format. It has very niche use cases, but compared to the mass, it's nothing. Um, heavy one has a decent shot of getting there. The reason is that basically it's one generation after, and every new codec has to fight against H.264, right? HVC is a complete failure. It was out in 2013, Industry invested several billion dollars just in R&D to have decoders and coders and so on. And it's deployed, well, on Blu-rays and on maybe ATSC3, right? As I said, right, it's a complete, complete mistake, complete failure. And one of the major failures is that the licenses were insane because all those guys got so greedy that they wanted like literally billions and like even Apple, a company famous for being very close to, to shareholders and creative industry, couldn't manage to license the Blu-ray stack and was difficult and couldn't really license correctly HVC because there was like three patent pools that were insane. So HVC after 10 years is maybe at 10% of the stream, 15. So VVC at 266, I mean, come on, it's never going to get there. Everyone being inside the web browser is going to have a decent shot at that, but it's still a long way to go, right? Because who's deploying it today? Not many people. It's better than VP9, sure, but we're still far. Is there also a chicken and egg situation there of you need more hardware in the market that can decode it in hardware before people will adopt it? Is it not just a licensing issue? It's also that, right? So that's why like on video, we created this uh, David, which is an extremely fast uh, AV1 decoder. And I managed to sell that to the Aliens for Open Media very early, saying like, guys, you need a good software decoder and one that is extremely fast, not decent fast. So we wrote most of it in assembly and it's insanely fast. To give you an idea, David is around 30,000 lines of C and around 190,000 lines of handwritten assembly. 190, right? That's insane, right? I, I don't know any other software in the world from property or open source that is writing that much assembly by hand. But the thing is, you have like four or five platforms and well, you need to do that, right? Because every cycle counts because it's on billions of machines. So we hope that it helps on improving AV1, but yeah, now we need hardware decoder. I was going to ask, is is that just x86 assembly that you've done so far, or are you actually supporting like every major architecture? So we have three on x86. So we have x86 32 bits, x86 64 bits in, S, in AVX2. We have the same on SSC3, because for example, uh, video console are still AVX based, and so they don't have AVX2. Uh, so that's three for x86, and for ARM, it's ARM 7, 32 bits, and ARM. 8, 64 bits. And now we also have some PPC and some AVX512, but that's still quite limited. So I feel like we've been hearing the phrase VLC 4.0 for quite a while, or at least I, you know, I've seen that floating around as, as development has continued. What's the progress on the new version uh, at this point? 
So the difficulty for VLC4 is that we have to tackle a lot of uh, technical debt that was there since an extremely long time. And the thing is, we are able to work on that only when we have a very good stable version. And VLC3 was extremely stable and extremely good if you compare about the crash reports and, and the issue reports. It's pretty good over there, right? So that was a time. And especially we had to redesign the video output in the core and the clock, which is synchronizing audio and video. And that's extremely tricky to replace. Maybe we did some mistakes in managing all that, but a lot of moving parts are done in the core. And at the same time, we started to change the UI because that's basically the only thing where people basically actually complain to us. So it's advancing quite well. Um, the, the clock, I think, is now good. We are still have some issues on video filters that we want to be able to push on the GPU because most of the time the, the filters were on the CPU side. So all that comes. And we need all those bases for the next 10 years, right, for HDR, for stuff like dual stack of subtitles so you can have like two languages playing at the same time. A lot of those things. Uh, also the API, the LibVNC API was not, like I think we did not break the LibVLC API since 2008, right? So there was a lot of craft on, on audio. We have object-based audio and ambisonics and so on. Right? So there is a lot of thing there. The thing is, it's going to be out when it's ready and people don't understand that. And the thing is, like, VLC3 works fine, right? It's not like when we did some releases where that was not amazing, like the 2.0, for example, which was not a good one. Uh, we had to rush then to put a 2.1. Right? Here, 3.0 works fine, right? So, and, and we're going to have like major changes in the UI and probably indexing of third-party content and NAS content and maybe like internet content. And that's like difficult. And change is going to be difficult, right? So we need to do it well. That's, that's why. Sure. It sounds like you're focusing on a lot of infrastructural improvements in, in 4. Um, are, are there any kind of user-facing, like, major features that people should know about? Yeah. On, on, so on video, the biggest changes are going to be, like, uh, the filters that are basically all going to be able to do on, on the GPU. A lot of work on HDR and mostly, like, playing HDR on non-HDR screens, right? So tone mapping, reverse tone mapping, upscaling on the GPU, downscaling on the GPU and with high quality the audio fidelity is going to increase quite a lot, right? Audiophile and Meloman realize that audio on VLC has many issues, mostly because it's shifting the pitch. This is fixed. Object-based audio, I said already. Uh, new filters for audio, that's major ones. On subtitles, being able to have like two subtitles. You don't care, you, but uh, for many people outside of the US, you want to learn another language. So having like the subtitle in the two languages is great. So you can watch an American movie and have like your native and the, the other that you're trying to learn at the same time. So the whole clock system is integrated. Uh, we did all the input, we, we did the, the input player so that we can have gapless, what is something that is way closer to gapless than it was in the past with uh, buffering. So all that is more or less visible. And then the UI will be different. Uh, you will be able to index your everything, all the files you have on your machines. You can index everything on your NAS. So it's going to just store it as a kind of media library database. Or you're going to be able to like have a kind of browsing of third-party peer tube or something directly inside the UI. So a lot of changes closer between Android and desktop. And of course, the people who don't want that, they're just going to double click on the file and just VLC would work. So your group has also had uh, VLMC, the Video Land Movie Creator in progress, which is a nonlinear video editor based on libvlc, which like, to me sounds like an idea with an incredible amount of potential. Is is, is that project still progressing or? No, it... it's dead. It, oh, it, this project is, is dead. Um, the thing is, there are now good alternatives. I think Shortcut is one. KDN Live is also one. But we were always a bit frustrated about the solutions around that because we wanted something that was actually cross-platform. And those are not really, really cross-platform, not on Android, not on iOS and so on. But the thing is, we, we never managed to, to get the right uh, resources and people to work on that. JB, it's clear that you've spent a lot of time thinking about open source software and, and the whole model for that. Do you feel like it's working these days as a business model for folks or is it or, or are you seeing problems in the open source world? Are you talking free software or open source? I guess I think free is in source code is available software. 
Yeah, so that's the difficulty, right? Like, I think open source has won, right? It's like everyone has done it, right? It's amazing. Even Microsoft or Apple are pushing open source. Actual free software is really lacking, right? Like, uh, if you look even at... Um, so VLC is sure, but look, you look at KDE and other community-based software, and mostly on the desktop, it's going down, right? And now everything is a SaaS, everything is online, everything is a website, it moves. And the thing is, there are not many open source websites, right? So or the whole stack, so deployment, SRE, Python, Node, and so on, that, all that is open source. And it's like really MIT, right? They don't care, right? They just build, 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 build on. But the last thing which has like the high value is often not open source. I would bet that 90% of the code running on Facebook is open source, right? But that's the last 10%, which makes billion. And so it's very difficult to have like really a free software community based or at least like open community around software. On the business model side, like like especially for VLC, there is no open source B2C business model, right? There is one exception, which was Mozilla, because Mozilla had this advertisement for Google on the top right. But beside Mozilla, like there is almost no one that managed to, to get a business model, right? Which means that the, all the business models are related to B2B and infrastructure, which is great, right? But, you know, like it's a bit less funny, right? And people, when you look at what people are doing on the machine, well, they launch a web browser, which is not open source. They are going to play to open D PDFs and docs with Adobe. It's not open source. They, or the whole creative stack is not open source. The Adobe and Premiere and, and all those people are going to play video games. So many of them are not open source. Yeah. And if you move, but you have a few open source tools still, Firefox, VLC, and so on. But Firefox is in a bad situation, let's be honest. And then you move to phones, and in phones, it's ridiculous. Like, nothing is open source. Well, you have your Android phone, and absolutely nothing is open source. No application is open source over there, right? And most of those applications are closed source, and so many of them are basically uh, by privacy suckers, right? They, they, they eat all the data, and that's how they make money. So on the run side, like the open source development way, uh, Agile and GitLab, GitHub, CI, CD is really everywhere. And like, it would be insane to, to not use open source to do that. But that's really like open source business. And everything that is not pure business is in not a good state. How does VLC work as a business? Are you all... It doesn't. There is no business model on VideoLand. That's easy, right? Like the VideoLand nonprofit, which... so. We still talk about the, how VLC got created. What happened is that VLC almost died in 2006 and seven, And then, so I was at the university in 2003. So what happened is that in 2007, 2008, I pulled everything out of the university and created a non-profit, VideoLand non-profit, classical open source uh, non-profit. And with that, we started to grow. The non-profit is still there. It owns the server, the domain name, the source code and so on. But it has, I mean, no money, right? It has some money, but you cannot hire even one full-time engineer with that money. But there is no business model, which is also good, right? Because as I said before, it's a good protection against lawsuits. I don't have money. You get nothing for them to take. So there's no reason for them to sue you, right? So what happens then is how do we pay people to get around VLC? There are several companies which are basically kind of consulting software B2B companies who are integrating the VLC engine or other FFmpeg-based solution and so on around the communities and employ people also to improve, to improve uh, VLC and FFmpeg. And, and that's how people are, are doing that. But those companies are here to accelerate the VLC development or FFmpeg. But if they are not there, the software will not die. So that's pretty good. So I, th I think one of the features of VLC that I appreciate the most, but I also think is not very widely known is that it has a pretty extensive command line interface. I, I use it. So I use VLC as a kind of a preview window for my capture card. I just pull it in as a direct show uh, device from the command line. Do you have any sense of how many people use the command line features? Quite a few more than you would expect, to be honest. So the, the command line is not as extensive as the one from FFmpeg, but it's 
very good if you want to do transcoding of live and preview captures and so on, because there is not that much tool who can do that. So FMPEG is not done for that, while VLC was done for that. But it's still, like, in terms of percentage of our users, it's nothing, right? Like, 99% of the VLC users have no idea what open source is, and maybe it's 99.99%, right? So in the, the very few who are using, which is maybe 3% of them are on Linux, then I guess around, yeah, 100, 1% of the user of VLC, 1,000, I don't know, very, very few. Because even like imagine it's one, one thousand. It's still five hundred thousand people. It's still large. What what is your favorite kind of underuse or sort of hidden feature in VLC? I mean, I feel like it's capable. You know, like I mentioned, I use it for for capture preview. You know, it, it has all kinds of networking features, as you said. Like, is there a feature that's kind of a favorite of yours that you feel like nobody knows about or uses? So there there are two two of the the first one is a puzzle feature. So there is this very weird puzzle filter, which basically you click on it and actually gives you a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, right? So you can actually click on there and move until you, you put it back, right? So it was done by a French uh, math teacher in, I guess, high school, who did that in order to introduce to his students uh, what are Bayesian curves, right? Which is an amazing tool. And so he did that, and it just jigsaw puzzle thing is works extremely well. And the thing is, the code has not been touched for 10 years, right? So, like, and you wonder who's going to use that, except, like, when your girlfriend forces you to watch Twilight or another boring French movie, and you're just, like, bored. So you just click to go faster because you want to that. So what happens is that, I think it was six or seven years ago, there was a guy mailing me saying, well, you know what, I have a problem. Is that You're going to find me weird, but your puzzle is too simple. Just like, what? <laughs> said, yeah, yeah, because, and that's true in the UI, you could put until 16, right? Because 16 by 16, 266, I did that was like, he says, yeah, 16 by 16 is way too simple. Can you increase that? I was just like, are you actually using that feature? <laughs> so that's why now you can do more. So that's a very funny one because it's interesting that even like very weird features actually get used software and it gets in a module in VLC, it stays for a long, long time and still works because the architecture of VLC is quite well designed. So that's a, a feature I like. The second feature I like that almost no one uses is um, basically to do screencasting. Um, the, there are cases where you want to actually do screencasting from, from remote and you don't have time or uh, capability to install OBS or something like that. And you can actually do that with VLC and that's pretty cool. So I was I was surprised a couple of years ago when I discovered that VLC is actually available on the iOS App Store because because VLC is so open and has such extensive capabilities for various media playback and so forth. Like it's just not the kind of app I expect to find on the App Store because of Apple's incredibly tight control of everything on their platform. What was it like getting that app on on the App Store? Like has there ever been any friction with Apple's gatekeepers in terms of the app's capability? Many, I think we got down twice at least maybe three times. So it was difficult. The thing is, and most of the open source and free software folks don't like when I say that, but I'm very happy that people use VLC because they like VLC and not because it's open source, right? Like as I said, 99.9% .9 have no idea what open source is and that's okay, right? Because in my opinion, if you want to move people to open source, you need to provide solutions that are almost as good as property software. You cannot say, well, use it because it's open source. Well, people are lazy, right? We have so many things in our life, right? So you need to be, maybe not exactly, but like very close to in terms of features, right? And, and so for a long time, VLT, uh, there was a debate whether we should be on non-open source platform. And the answer was, you know what? Like, yes, we need to be absolutely everywhere to bring people to show that there are tools that are done by communities that are actually very good and usable and are better than property software. And the moving to iOS was a necessity. It has been very difficult because the App Store is actually GPL incompatible. And I did a very long and extensive analysis of that, which was, to be honest, way more complex and way more precise than what the Free Software Foundation did, which was just like, ah, Apple, bad. And technically, 
it's extremely complex because it boils down to whether you consider the GPL as a end user license agreement or not. And the GPL V2 in this um, freedom zero, which is uh, which is basically you, no limitation of usage, uh, which is implied, is very difficult to understand in at least a license. Right? So what happened in the end is that because we are licensing the VLC engine from GPL v2 to LGPL, is the version of on iOS is dual license, GPL v2 and MPL, MPL2. And the MPL is compatible with the App Store. The GPL is not. So we have the two versions. So the GPL version is here if you want to jailbreak and deploy on your own phone, or if you are have a developer license and so you can use it on your own machine. It works. I test it every time you take the IPA, you put your IE code and you deploy. Or for the uh, for the iOS app store, you can use MPL. It's not great, but it's either that or, or no VLC on the app store. On the uh, just out of curiosity, do you have any idea how many platforms VLC is on at this point? It's a funny question, right? I really like that because like, you realize that VLC is on more platforms than most other open source or non-open source platforms, right? And like, for example, if you take any stack from Microsoft, we are on more platforms, right? Like Office, we are more platform than Office. We are probably more platforms than VS Code or or Teams, right? Because like we are on all mobile and, and TVs and, and so on. We are on more platform than Chrome, I guess, because like, for example, we still support Windows XP and, and Mac OS 10.9 or 10.7. Right? So we are really in places where Chrome doesn't exist and same for Firefox, right? So Firefox on iOS does not exist, right? It's front end to, uh, to the web view, right? So that's really weird. Is that this, so we are still on OS 2, Right, so no one wow. cares about that. Wow, <laughs> we are on somebody all cares. The BS. Well, the guy who's maintaining the port, of yeah. course, he does. <laughs> um, we are on all the BSDs. We are on iOS, Apple TV, uh, um, iPad OS, Android, Android TV, all the desktop, all the BSDs, uh, and on desktop, we are still like VLC three support Windows XP. Right, like they've lost that five six years ago. So it's really weird that a very small team because like the core team of VLC is five people is able to do that which show that most of the property software companies which have a ton of money like billions or literally billions are just lazy right <laughs> that makes sense it, i was gonna say and, and then the reach with x264 has to go even beyond that right like so many things run your yeah like it's just everywhere yeah so if you talk about not vlc but x264 which is the encoder from the video and community it's basically powering every video online. Everything YouTube, everything Facebook video, everything Netflix and so on. Of course, they now use another encoder for VP9, but for H264, which is now still 85% of the market, it's very, very, very large. And they all use that and contribute nothing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, X264 is still the default encoder in OBS for that matter. You know, like just about everybody's streaming to Twitch unless they're you know, throwing the encode on their GeForce or something is probably all like, has the ubiquity of X264 affected the core of VLC, you know, the, the way that you run the project for that to have blown up in, in the way that it did? Like, what has that, what is the effect? Been no, 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 no. That's like X264 is a separate software project from video LAN and that's okay. And it works fine. And we're happy with it. Right. It's just like, uh, I'm not frustrated in any sense that it's, people don't contribute back. It's okay. Right. That, that's the goal, right? If I knew what I know today, I would, might have done it in a different way, but like you cannot rewrite the past. What do you mean? Well, the thing is, like for example, today, if I do an, a new open source project, it's going to be dual license with uh, a Ferro GPL and a commercial license, which means that the normal people who just are users and don't make money are going to use the Afero version and every big company needs to pay for a commercial license because at some point it's not sustainable. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, JB, if people want to find out more about VLC, what's the best place to go? Well, if they want to contribute, they can go on videoland.org or they can join on IRC and the rest for the normal people just type VLC in your favorite search engine or on Wikipedia and download about it. Beautiful. Thank you again, JB, for taking the time to talk to us. I really enjoyed that conversation. I did realize after we finished recording, I didn't think to ask what VLC stands for. Very 
large... I don't know what VLC stands for either. If the internet is to be believed... The internet's never lied to me. Sure. Video LAN client. Well, that would make sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Huh. I'm, I'm not under... I'm, I guess I'm whelmed. I'm perfectly whelmed. I'm not underwhelmed. I'm not overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. It's exactly what I would expect. Yep. It's a heck of a name. It was a fantastic conversation. I'm really excited to learn more about VLC. And if you have ideas for folks that you think you would love to have us bring on the show, we would love to hear them. You can send them to fosspod at content.town. We've gotten a bunch of good suggestions ranging from stuff that people use and maybe don't realize they use, like Samba, mm-hmm. all the way up to some really novel open source projects that I wasn't even aware of. So please keep sending those suggestions, and we do, we do really appreciate yes, it. very helpful. Uh, as always, the FOSSBOT is brought to you by Google Open Source. They bring all of the value of open source to Google and all of the resources of Google to open source. You can find out more about Google Open Source at opensource.google. And Matt Purdy produced this episode of the show, and Sabrina Hill edited it. We will be back in two weeks with more FOSPOD. Until then, I guess we will see you all next time. Mm